Okay, so moving on to A4.2, which is conservation biodiversity. And some of this stuff kind of comes up quite a bit because um, we'll come back in D4 to looking more at climate change. And so some of this is going to be revisited a bit there. Um, but the emphasis here is um, on different factors all related to biodiversity. Uh, and some of it we kind of cover as well when we talk about adaptations and so forth. So not totally different, but a specific lens here of looking at uh, particularly at species extinction would be kind of the key area we're looking at. So what I want to start with is the three types of biodiversity and what evidence we can use to look at how the biodiversity is traveling for each. Uh, so we'll label this evidence for biodiversity. And so all of this is related to the idea that we are currently in a biodiversity crisis. So in particular, we can use for examining the current crisis in terms of biodiversity. Difficult to show, because if we compare it to the fossil record, it still looks like we have more species, certainly than ever um, uh, in far history. But there is evidence that kind of since the 1970s, the number of species is declining. So at the moment, the rate of species of extinction is actually higher than the rate of uh, speciation. So overall, we're showing a decrease uh, that this has been decreasing since the 1970s. So if we look at, okay, well, what tells us if that is in fact the case or not? Uh, it depends on kind of which type of biodiversity and how you measure it. So I did this in a little chart, a couple of charts we're going to do. Uh, so just to kind of show you that. So we're going to look at the type, what we mean by that type. So type definition, and then how can we measure it? Or what can we look at as evidence of a decline in it? So type And then we'll define that type. And then we'll look at ways to measure it. And that's actually the same concept as evidence of the decline. So the ways of measuring biodiversity would also be the same things we would use to show if there has in fact been a decline in it. Okay, so three different types. I will always draw my horizontal lines after I've written. Um, okay, so the first type is going, so we're gonna go from big to small. So big scale biodiversity, looking at it on a global or even just within a national level, we're not gonna just look at in within an ecosystem, we're gonna look at how many different ecosystem types are there. So this would be ecosystem biodiversity. And you can essentially define ecosystem biodiversity is the number of distinctive biomes or different types of ecosystems. So you could use the word ecosystem again, but I'll use biomes just for something slightly different. So are we seeing just all kind of grasslands or are we still seeing lots of diverse, different kind of functional ecosystems uh, on a global scale or kind of on a smaller scale as well? So what you want is to see all the different types of ecosystems all being successful and not kind of a removal of extreme ecosystems to only ecosystems that are less tolerant of different abiotic extremes. So the way we could do that is basically to actually look at the number of kind of biomes or habitats of each. So you can look at different habitat types. So you can do big scale biomes or narrow it down to slightly more specific habitats. How many different ones are there? Um, you could then look a little bit at making sure the percent covered by each type is remaining the same. So if not, like you say, oh, yes, there's still rainforest, but if there was previously like 30% of the world was uh, rainforest and now only 23% is, we're still seeing a decline in the percent covered by that. Or you could look more specifically at kind of the specific percent loss of ecosystem. So that would be looking at kind of how much damage has there been to different types. So again, those measures can be really good because you might still say there is rainforest, but it's become smaller or a large section of it has been damaged. Um, so those are ways to kind of monitor ecosystem biodiversity.
Often the most kind of used one is this middle ground, uh, which is to look at the species. So when we're talking endangered species, extinction, all of that, we're looking primarily at species level biodiversity. And so what we're looking at here is you would define that by essentially the number and distribution of species. So I included that distribution of just to account for like species evenness as well. So when we talk about species diversity, we wanna make sure that they're present and kind of in lots of different ecos in, in prevalent amounts. So uh, I don't know if distribution is the right word. Um, number and amount of or prevalence. Let's change distribution. Sorry, again, I'm using this. If you haven't worked this out, you need to use erasable pins with my diagrams to make up for me doing that to you. Um, number and prevalence of species. So making sure they're not just present, but present in sufficient amount. Okay, so then how would we actually work on calculating that? Well, we could look at two different things. So we could talk about species richness, which is literally just the number in that ecosystem or in that habitat. A lot of times it'd be habitat. Then we can look at species evenness, and that is going to be essentially the percent of the habitat that each covers. So are we looking at 90% one type and just a few stragglers, or are they pretty evenly spread? Um, and remember, you can calc in together. That would actually usually call our species diversity. And you can calculate that using Simpson's diversity index, which is not specifically named in the syllabus. So I don't think you necessarily have to memorize that formula. Uh, it's where you do big N times big N minus one over all the little N minus N times N minus one. Um, there's examples in the Oxford book if you wanna refer to that, but I would just generally like you to know that basically if you looked at these two concepts together, a lot of times that's believed to be the best indication of a mathematical value for the species diversity. Um, the other things that you might want to look at though, because sometimes by the time you see that they're gone, it's kind of like too late. So some other things that you can look at is just monitoring population sizes, which is kind of what species evenness is doing. So that's kind of a little bit of overlap there. Kind of related to that, you could look at the number of endangered species. So if we're starting to see, yes, the species are there, but more and more are becoming endangered, that would be an indication of loss of biodiversity. And again, that would usually show up in species evenness. Um, and then the other thing that you can monitor, which is kind of related to this, is kind of change in species ranges. So sometimes what you'll see is that species are becoming less tolerant. Um, so they're only being found in kind of smaller areas. And that's usually a warning sign as well if you're starting to see kind of reduced ranges. To be honest, most of those things all kind of come into this concept of evenness. Uh, but they're just ways to monitor evenness other than just mathematically is to check, are we seeing more endangered species? Are we seeing reduced ranges? Because if so, it's going to result in kind of more dominant species and removal altogether of others eventually. Okay, and so that's kind of where most of the research is done. But you can also look within a species and make sure that you're maintaining genetic biodiversity. And a lot of times these are related because if you start having kind of this situation happen where species are becoming endangered, what can happen is a lot more inbreeding. So you have smaller numbers of individuals, so more breeding between closely related individuals. And as a result, we're getting less kind of gene flow and less genetic diversity. Um, so if we're measuring this, this would be the number of unique alleles in the population. So are we seeing a high number of kind of unique genetic combinations or how much kind of genetic variation there is for each traits? So again, when we talk about genetic variation within species, so we're looking at one species and basically saying, are they all very similar or not? Because we know that if they're becoming very similar, that's not good for natural selection. That's not good for the overall health of the species. So you can do this a couple different ways. You can just look for phenotypic variation as an easy way of saying it. So if we start to see 
less kind of physical differences and lots of a species are all starting to look similar. That would be a warning sign of that. You can look at increase in genetic diseases. So if we see more and more genetic diseases popping up in a species, that suggests kind of impacts of inbreeding, whereby kind of more carriers mating with other carriers and resulting in that. Or the fanciest way to do it is genome sequencing. So we could actually do genome sequencing and actually determine exactly how diverse they are. Um, and we'll come back to looking a little bit at genetic variation when we talk about breeding programs, because that's one of the ex situ uh, strategies is to address that. So try to make sure we are maintaining genetic diversity within a species. Okay, so those are kind of the three different ways that you can measure uh, variation and how you would actually look for evidence of it. And again, probably the most common one is at a species level. Um, but if you kind of monitor this to protect your species and you protect all your species, then in theory, you should be able to maintain your ecosystems as well. Okay, next thing I wanna look at, and this, this section should be a little bit easier, but just stuff you have to know, um, is that we're gonna look at the anthropogenic causes of loss. So we're gonna kind of put them together um, in terms of both ecosystem and kind of species loss. Uh, there's a few extras if you read about uh, habitat loss and ecosystem loss, the books will allocate a few additional things like effects of mining uh, and a little bit more specialized, but you can use the same five for either. So the best thing is to know the five main ones and be able to relate them to either cause. Um, will work pretty well. Okay, so we are, again, they are going to use this fancy word because they love using fancy words. So anthropogenic. And that is just human cause. So they're related specifically to human inflicted. So we're not looking at other causes. And like I said, I'm gonna say that the same is the these same things cause both individual species to become extinct and whole ecosystems to be lost. So we're gonna look at extinction of species and ecosystem loss. Okay. So within that, we are going to make a table again. So again, just kind of a three-part table. So what is the cause? And then how has the increase in the human population contributed to it? And then what are the effects of it? So it, they want you to be able to link these causes to overpopulation uh, in particular, but then also be able to say, how are they negative? So we're gonna try to do it all in one chart to kind of link it all together. So we'll say cause, then we're gonna say, how is it impacted by the increase in human population size? And then what are some of the effects of it? Okay. So I just like to have some sort of acronym if I have to remember five things. So I'm using CHIPO, which is not even a very good acronym. So feel free to try to think of a better one, but I don't think I could think of anything else that quite worked with this set of letters. Um, HOPIC, if you want HOPIC, um, whatever you think will help you remember it. But if you have to remember five, it does help to kind of work your way through them. So I'm gonna use CHIPO, but you feel free to use whatever works for you. So C is for climate change. And again, we want to say, okay, well, how has the increase in the human population led to climate change? So one of the biggest impacts is that as the human population has increased in size, we are starting, we need to create more energy. So humans use energy uh, in the form of cars, electricity, things like that. And so to accommodate our energy needs, there's been an increase in the combustion of fossil fuels. And if you remember, we talked about this in uh, the C4 one in terms of the Keeling curve and looking at that kind of essentially being the biggest contributor to CO2 con uh, concentrations. So increase in combustion of fossil fuels causes an increase in the CO2 levels in the atmosphere. 
Um, and the increase in CO2 is a greenhouse effect, uh, gas. We are gonna do that properly in D4. So this is just a heads up, um, but most of you probably have heard that term before. So CO2 is a greenhouse gas, an increase in greenhouse gases equals global warming or climate change, which we said here. I'm actually specifically using the term global warming um, because the trapping of the actual uh, greenhouse gases does directly cause the warming of the temperatures. Um, and a lot of the effects are related to that, but it also changes like currents and lots of other impacts besides just warming. Um, what are the effects of that? So essentially what's happening is that abiotic changes are occurring faster than the rate of natural selection. So abiotic changes are faster than natural selection. And so essentially organisms are not adapted to their environment. And so this can result in things like smaller ranges. So that's one impact of that. So organisms no longer living at the kind of extremes um, is one example of how that could have an impact. So quickly, you know, increasing changing of the environment faster than adaptations of a love means they just stop living in certain environments. Okay, so that's one. There's other kind of ways it could impact it, but we'll leave that as our main one for that one. I uh, just need to be able to explain one pretty well. Okay, CHIPO, so H is for habitat loss. And when we say habitat loss, we are meaning deforestation plus. By far the biggest habitat that's negatively impacted by humans is forests. Um, so that has been the most substantial, but deforestation is a little bit of a specific term. So this is habitat loss, including deforestation. Um, so what is the impact of humans, particularly deforestation is one of the biggest things to use the land for. And we use it for a couple different things. So it can be used, like one of the first things that it was used for was farming. So essentially creating food. So instead of having forests, we want areas that are better for farming of crops, um, for housing, and then now for kind of urban cities. So as we have more people, we need more resources, space, and we started to develop urbanization. And that's caused even more dramatic because now we're not just having people having their own home. Uh, we're having whole kind of infrastructure. The other thing that's also used is just logging, which is essentially meaning we're not using the whole space. We just want the actual timber itself to build houses and things like that. So uh, leaving the rest of the ecosystem, but just trying to take the trees out of it. Um, and basically what's happening here is extinction of species due to loss of home. And it can be directly due to their loss of home or it can be due to their loss of food source. So there can be kind of ongoing trophic impacts so if we remove a lot of plant life, uh, it may be that the birds were directly living in the tree or it may have been that they were reliant on those leaves. So sometimes we remove animals' food source um, by when we do deforestation. So either one of that uh, can have a similar impact, but basically we're removing their habitat, which means they're going to um, be in trouble. <laughs> And those are probably, that's probably habitat loss is probably the biggest and most direct human impact. Uh, well, there's two that are pretty big, but that, that one and over harvesting, which are actually very closely related, um, are really big ones. Uh, I, and in fact, if I weren't trying to make my cool acrostic, I probably would have started with over harvesting uh, and done over harvesting and deforest and habitat loss is kind of the two biggest ones. And some of these other ones are a bit more secondary uh, to all of that. Invasive species. And to clarify, something like climate change is definitely gonna have the biggest cumulative effect. But if we're talking specifically about making species go extinct or re destroying an ecosystem, uh, some of these other ones are longer, like invasive species can add up and cause problems, um, but probably the most substantial are just deforestation and um, overhunting are probably the two overall biggest human impacts. Okay, so if we talk invasive species, how is that related to the large human population size? Well, as the human population has gotten larger, not only their size, but the increased amount of travel. 
So increased human travel. And that comes with size, but also technology advancements in terms of air travel um, has caused intentional or accidental spread of species. So sometimes humans have done it intentionally. A lot of times now we have better understanding that uh, about invasive species, but it, it still happens accidentally. So just as a consequence of travel. Um, and basically what happens is they will outcompete native species. And so this is particularly problematic more for extinction of species than necessarily whole habitat loss. Um, so that's probably one that's a little bit more specific to one versus the other. P is for pollution. So when we talk about pollution, uh, essentially how is that related to humans? So essentially humans, basically industry. So human industry, and manufacturing. So humans have created kind of plants and things like that, and they do two a couple of different things. Uh, they can release chemicals into the air. So that's kind of air pollution. But then also they can release things into the water, particularly plastics into oceans. is an example. How can this result in uh, endangered species? So it could be like poor respiratory conditions due to air pollution. Um, and then probably if you look at plastic and oceans, there can be direct impacts of basically like, I hate to write suffocation because it's pretty harsh, but it's essentially true. So suffocation of aquatic life because of plastics. So plastic bags, straws, drink containers, all of those things um, ending up in the oceans can be a direct threat to the species that live there. Okay, and then the last one is going to be over harvesting. And again, if we were talking about ecosystem loss, it's going to be a lot of the kind of over harvesting and deforestation that's going to really impact ecosystems. Uh, some of these other ones are going to be more on it and climate change. So ecosystems becoming in uh, inhospitable and things like that. Um, okay, over harvesting. So essentially that's pretty straightforward. More people increases the need for food. and other kind of resources. So essentially, as we increase the human population, even if humans are not doing things like industry industry and urbanization, if they're just simply trying to get their own basic needs let met, the sheer size of the population is making it very difficult to meet all of those needs. And our particular examples of this are gonna be basically hunting for food, excess farmland, which comes back to the first, the other part about habitat loss because removing various different uh, environments just to use it always for farmland to create more food. And then the also thing is basically using uh, for textiles. So that could be things like, you know, removing wools um, from sheep in order to create uh, fabrics and things like that. So a lot of times we also use animals, not just for food, but we use animals, plants, woods, all of that for kind of human uh, con purchasing and consumerism and things like that. Okay, so then those are our causes. And again, you can use those for causes of extinction. Uh, and then most of those you could also apply then to on a bigger scale, how is that resulting in the entire loss of habitats um, as well. So a lot of those same factors are having a bigger impact on habitats and ecosystem loss as well. Okay, love. similar to this, but I'm gonna erase, cause I'm gonna make another chart. So I've got like basically two diagrams left. I'm going to do them both on half a page. I'll show you what I mean after I erase in just a second. Okay, so we need to go through the, in the, so half and half. So this, 
and then that's going to go on that side. Um, in the actual syllabus, they have three named examples. So I'm trying to, if there's named examples that you need to be able to account for, um, to be able to make sure we at least touch on that. So there's three case studies that are named. And then on top of that, you're supposed to know like an additional local example. So I'm not going to write that down because I'm not going to ask you a specific question on it. Um, but worth remembering that you are supposed to go beyond that. So these are the ones that have been specifically named in the syllabus, which means they could, in theory, just point blank ask you, explain how the giant moas are an example of an anthropological cause of extinction. So they could go kind of straight into it uh, versus they could say, identify two different examples, in which case you could get credit by giving your own one. Um, but you have to know these three. So case studies to know. So the fir two first two are species extinction. Um, and then the last one is an ecosystem. Here's the island. Giant moas. These are the giant flightless birds that basically look like giant emus. Um, so they became extinct in New Zealand. A long time ago, so somewhere around 500 years ago, 500 to 1,000 years ago. So they've been traced back to about 1,300, so it could be closer to 1,000, but probably started somewhere in that range where they started becoming endangered around there. So anywhere from about 500 to 1,000 years ago, which I'm aware is a really big time period. Um, so they began their decline uh, with the introduction of Polynesian people who were hunting them. Uh, and then over that period of that 500 year period, they became more and more endangered till they became extinct. Um, and so they were basically over hunted by humans. So with these, a lot of what we're looking at is what is the anthropological cause. Um, so over hunting for food, they were basically just used as a, a food source. So there wasn't like another use uh, for them. So in particular, when a certain uh, new group of settlers came in, that's what happened. Okay, next example, which is a similar one, but they said you need to know both, uh, just because it's hunting basically by humans, is the Caribbean, Caribbean monk seal. And there's actually still Mediterranean monk seals, but they're actually becoming uh, endangered for similar reasons. So they were more recent, so they've actually become extinct in the Caribbean, including in the Gulf of Mexico, which probably means nothing for me to include that to you, but since I'm from Texas and you're the Gulf of Mexico, I care about that. Um, so, and but this one's more recent, so that one's probably been in the last 100 years. So closer to 50, I think, but slightly more than 50. I think they were spotted in like 1960s still. Um, so in the last 50 to 100 years, they've become extinct. Again, also due to overhunting, kind of two reasons. Partly because they have no fear, um, so they don't run away from humans. Uh, so they just hang out and then, what do you know, they get overhunted. Um, so due to their own kind of fearlessness, but then also then there actually were extracted oil from them to use for lamps. So slightly different reason. It wasn't actually for food in this case. So it was still kind of hunted, um, but in this case, it was more for kind of resource other than food uh, that they were used for. So just like kind of how we use uh, fossil fuels, they were a form of creating an energy source uh, that was used. And so that's what happened to the Caribbean monk seals. And then last one is an actual, so this is a species extinction. Hopefully that's clear, but I'll make a note of that. And then the last example is an ecosystem that you have to know, which is the Dipterocarp forest. So Dipterocarp forest. And what's happening there is it's being dramatically lost. So dramatic kind of reduction. So it's not completely gone, um, but it's a kind of a dramatic ecosystem loss. 
but it's still there, but our dramatic loss of coverage. Uh, and it is kind of ongoing. So this is not something that is already gone. It's still kind of currently undergoing this damage. Um, and it's basically <clears throat> two reasons. So one is logging for trees. So use of timber from the forest. Uh, it's basically marked by lots and lots and lots of different plant and tree species. So it's a tons of different tree types. So it's heavily used for timber because of its high density of trees. Um, and then the other thing is that they're basically tearing down the forest because that area, that grounding is really useful for palm oil plantations. Um, so logging and then clearance for palm oil plantations. So palm oil is used in lots of human products. Um, so what they're doing is they're taking away a very biodiverse forest and planting a whole bunch of one type of plant. So yes, there's still in terms of, there's still plant life there. So it's not been cleared for human housing, but we're removing diverse range of species to put lots of one type because they make a product that's beneficial for humans. So this is an ecosystem loss or decline. That you need to know. Okay, so there's your three possible ones that you could be asked about by name. Otherwise, you could be asked to provide an example, in which case you can give one of those, or you can give a different example that you know that's relevant, uh, that's local, or that's just something that's interesting. So for Australia, you might want to talk about an organism that's been outcompeted by invasive species instead. Um, whatever, it, you're open uh, unless they specifically ask you about one of those three. Okay, last thing is we need to look at conservation conservation efforts. So we've talked a lot about how bad all this is, and I'm just putting this next to it here to finish this off. So what are some things that can be done to maintain biodiversity? Uh, and so we're talking specifically conservation of biodiversity, because that's where we're at with this. Um, and so essentially we're going to look at the dividing into two big categories. So conservation efforts can be either in situ or ex situ. So in a situ efforts are gonna take place in the natural ecosystem. So in the actual, they're usually related to kind of a species. So in the natural ecosystem itself, or that individual's natural habitat. And so obviously that is gonna be the priority. So the best thing to do is to do uh, efforts that keep them where they're supposed to be and that restore their own natural habitat. So this is our priority. We want to do in situ efforts, that is good. Um, and it's also a good preventative tool. So if we do really good in situ efforts, the hope is that we won't have to do ex situ efforts. So these can be used to prevent. Ex situ is gonna be efforts done outside the natural ecosystem or habitat. And this could be really outside, i.e. like essentially in a laboratory, or it could be just in a created ecosystem. So the key is just that it wasn't their natural environment. And these can be really helpful as well. Um, so they're not as, these are kind of, if we can do in situ, that's usually the choice. Um, but there are instances as we go through some examples where these can be really beneficial as well. Uh, and in theory, a best case would be to kind of pair both of them uh, would be ideal as well. Okay, so when we say in situ efforts are, what kind of ones would that fall into? So three kind of categories, uh, which would be the essentially like active management but without interference. So active management to prevent human influence. So that could be prevent invasive species, preventing pollution, preventing deforestation. So you can kind of actively manage and basically not allow human influence. 
And the best examples of that is going to be national parks and nature reserves. And so a lot of times they will ban hunting. They can kind of police and prevent other species from being introduced. Uh, they can, you know, not allow deforestation. So things like that. So active management of an existing area to kind of prevent things from happening if they're at risk. Um, the next thing that you can do is actually like once it's too far gone. So that's kind of first step. Um, but if there's too much damage, you can do rewilding which would be basically return or removal of species. So rewilding can be return of native uh, species and it can also be, rewilding can be considered removal of kind of invasive species. So you're still basically letting the ecosystem go, uh, but with a little bit of help. So uh, kind of tweaking and then reclamation which would be to take the original ecosystem, but it's had so much damage that you would have to actually do some replanting and reestablishment of that ecosystem. So those are kind of different levels of um, interference. Uh, and so rewilding can be kind of return of native life. So return of organisms that would be helpful. Um, and then reclamation can be kind of rebuilding in its original habitat. So this would require a little bit more hands-on work, but you're still staying within that habitat. So generally, if you can start by just managing and preventing, that's the key, but as there becomes more damage, you can look at those things. Okay, for ex situ efforts, um, these are things that are outside the natural ecosystem, uh, but can be really helpful. So a good example of one that can be really helpful is kind of zoo breeding programs. And so what they can do is they can actually use artificial insemination and they can actually help in some ways even more than a staying in the wild, because if you have a species that are geographically isolated and therefore doing a lot of inbreeding, you can lose genetic, genetic diversity. So it can be that actually doing some deliberate breeding programs can actually help increase genetic diversity of species. So they can actually help with maintaining that. The other thing that you can do is kind of create habitats. Um, that are similar to kind of, they have lots of plant life growing in them. So that would be things like botanic gardens and even well done zoos uh, that have kind of natural free range zoos, things like that would be examples of basically creating uh, man-made kind of artificial, so it's not natural, but kind of planting or creating a new habitat. And a lot of times these can be really successful ways, particularly with plant species, of continuing to allow them to thrive. And then the third one, which again, kind of like the zoo programs, can be a really helpful in addition to. So do all of the in situ efforts that you can, but as a kind of backup option is to basically create a seed and tissue base. And they could play a role down the track. So best if done before species extinction, and they could actually allow for kind of rejuvenation down the road. So a lot of times they can be created even if the species is not currently threatened, um, but if it starts to decrease in numbers. Seed ones are really helpful and easy, so pretty easy to collect seeds and just keep them for if they are needed. Uh, animal tissue banks are a bit more tricky, but you could do things like uh, sperm banks, uh, egg, egg storage, uh, or certain tissue types, uh, embryonic stem tissue, uh, cord blood, things like that are possible as well. It tends to be much more expensive because you're looking at cryogenetic, um, cryogenic methods of maintaining it. So those are a little bit trickier. Um, and then the other thing to say all on, on all of this is basically like, what species do you make these efforts for? So kind of how do you prioritize what species you're gonna conserve? Because we can say, um, 
Okay, well, we want to prioritize everything, which is true. That's kind of the idea of biodiversity. Um, but we use the EDGE program. So um, that is basically an idea to look at how kind of endangered are they and also how genetically unique are they. So the EDGE of existence... And so basically it takes into consideration their endangered status. So the ICUN endangered status. But it also takes into account how genetically unique are they? So we're specifically trying to look out for organisms that are endangered and don't have kind of close genetic relationships um, and that might have lost some genetic variation. Uh, so plus genetic uniqueness. So that is essentially used, that combination of saying, well, if they're endangered, that needs to raise our attention. And if they fill a genetic kind of specific role and they look like their DNA is quite distinct, they might have a harder time. Uh, they might fill a more unique role or they might also be having lower genetic diversity, which might mean they need to a little bit more intervention with programs like that. So there are kind of things taken into in place that help us to kind of identify identify priority species uh, and that can also be used to work out like which species should be kind of used uh, in tissue banks and things like that that are expensive is to isolate those species. All right so that's everything for A4. Well done and good luck. Okay, part two of A4.1, uh, and as we head into this, it is worth noting that I am making one video for both higher level and standard level, um, so I am going to let you know when I start on stuff that's really HL specific um, and kind of notate that, so if you are revising this um, and you are a standard level student, it's just good to know what you don't need to know, um, but I am going to include it all kind of in one place. Um, so where we're going now is the second part of this, is now that we've talked about evolution, natural selection, now we're going to look at how evolution can lead to, or several different things can lead to, the formation of a new species. So let's define, it should be pretty straightforward, what speciation is. So speciation is generally, as it sounds like, the formation of a new species. And in particular, when we talk about speciation, we're generally talking about from one original species. So basically, one species becomes two or even two or more. So when we look at adaptive radiation, sometimes it can divulge into not just two, but multiple at the same time. Um, but in particular, they used to be one species and now they are not. Okay, so let's talk about what is required, and this is still SL. So SL, you do need to know what it is, and you do need to know what it requires, and then we'll go into the terminology that's very much HL uh, material. So let's look at what does it require and why. So you need to be really specific on the two things it requires. And to the point where mark schemes will not give you points unless you say both. Um, so it requires, first of all, reproductive isolation. So if they keep mating with each other, they will not become separate species. They'll keep trading uh, genes. So even if they're starting to go through different adaptive uh, things, they'll just keep sharing those new alleles and it won't work. So there has to be reproductive isolation. But reproductive isolation is not enough. So if two organisms are reproductively isolated and they do not mate, but if the opportunity arose and they could start mating again and they're still able to mate with each other, then they are technically still one species. So for it to be two species, they need to like not be able to create viable offspring even if given the opportunity. So if a river goes through, they're separated, but then down the road, the river dries up and they go back to making babies together, they were never truly two species. So they need to have been isolated then during their time of isolation, they need to have evolved so that they are no longer compatible. So that is going to be due to they're now undergoing different evolutionary processes, and we're going to call that differential selection. So once isolated, 
their little natural selection journeys need to be different that send them into different ways. So let's talk about why for that. And I think the first one is more obvious, but as long as they are reproducing, whatever the selective pressures they are undergoing, they're still exchanging genetic material, so it'll never happen. So the purpose of the isolation is to prevent gene flow. So gene flow is just the transfer of alleles. So if a mutation happens in one population, but not the other, but then they go mate together, it's, it's brought it over to them. So basically we want no transfer of genetic material between them. The second requirement is a little bit more complicated. So essentially we need natural selection to create genetic differences between them. And to the point where those genetic differences prevent breeding. So they need to create genetic differences that prevent the production of fertile offspring. So if they get separated, reproductively isolated, but they do not evolve differently to one another, they will just still be the same species. So a good way of thinking of it is if I went and I took eggs from this bird and I mixed it with sperm from this bird, do they make babies? If they make fertile babies, it doesn't matter if they are not actually actively mating in the wild. If I can make them mate, they are one species. If I take their egg and their sperm and I join them together and they either do not create an offspring or the offspring is sterile, then they are separate species. So that is really the key is that it has to hit this point, which is that ultimately for them to be two species, there needs to be the production of uh, prevention of fertile offspring being formed. Okay, so now let's look at the different types um, of this. So we're gonna kind of look at essentially three different categories. So we're gonna do allopatric, sympatric, and then via polypoidy, which is kind of, yeah, a separate way. So there's kind of three different ways that this can happen. Um, and we're gonna, but I'm gonna do allopatric and sympatric first, and then we'll hit, okay, well, there's a third way that this can happen where the reproductive barrier is actually due to polyploidy. Um, so we'll look at that as kind of a subset. Okay, so now, like I said, now we are going into what I would consider uh, to be HL only material. So just a heads up. So if you are watching this for revision and you're an SL student, you are free to kind of take a break from it here. Um, so we're going to look at the different types. And like I said, I'm going to ultimately look at three because we can actually look at uh, polyploids as a third pattern. It doesn't quite fit into either of these two. Um, but the two main ones that we generally talk about and certainly the only two that are relevant for animals are allopatric versus sympatric speciation. So these are subcategories of speciation. So if we say here, speciation, these are two types of speciation. And what makes them distinct is what the initial barrier was. So what the initial reproductive isolation is. So they both have the same rule. They need reproductive isolation plus differential selection. Um, so if we're talking allopatric speciation, the reproductive isolation is geographic isolation. So geographic isolation is a type of reproductive isolation. So we have geographic isolation plus, we still need differential selection. So in this case, the reproductive isolation was geographic in nature. When we say geographic isolation, that means there is a physical barrier to them even meeting. So physical barrier to contact. So they are no longer able to be in contact with one another. If we actually talk about sympatric speciation, this time the reproductive isolation is not geographic. It's one of, it's a non-geographic. There's actually more examples, but you only need to know two. So the two possible that you need to know are temporal isolation or behavioral isolation.
There's some others that relate to like gametic isolation where they actually just their gametes are incompatible. Um, but then they start to get a little bit confusing and close to other areas. So you just need to know those two for right now. Um, so when we say temporal isolation, it's gonna, sorry, I know it's annoying when I do that and you don't have whiteboard markers. Uh, so when I say temporal isolation, it means breeding at different times. When I say behavioral isolation, we mean incompatible courtship rituals. So those are kind of the two things. So those are my three types of reproductive isolations. And we will add polyploidy as kind of a reproductive isolation in a minute. Those are our three main ones. In this case though, let's remember that you still must have differential selection. So we could say, oh, they don't mate anymore, these two plants, because their breeding seasons have differed. Um, and, but if I took the pollen and took the uh, flower and made it happen and boom, there's new flowers, there's still one species. So they have to have the enough genetic changes accumulate that they no longer do. Okay, so again, you can kind of thinking about this in terms of summary, if we're talking allopatric speciation, we're talking about essentially uh, removed, so they're in two areas. So they're separate to one another, and so the speciation occurs in two separate areas. In sympatric speciation, this is occurring in one geographic area. So these are arising, but they are still in one area. So that's kind of the distinction there. Just to remind you, because I just wanted to make this clear again, that I'm putting an HL here, that these terms are HL only. Temporal isolation is JHL and behavioral isolation. SLs could need to use the term geographic as an example of a reproductive isolating bear. That's the only one that you would need to go as SL. You would just say geographic is the reason. Okay, so... Within this, let's talk about one kind of subset of speciation, um, and then we will add two little points, and then we'll go on to polyploidy and knock this out. Okay, so one type, and this type is often considered to be allopatric, but it could actually be either. So it's an example, kind of an extreme example of speciation. And it comes back to what I said over here with this. That sometimes um, a speciation event can cause multiple different species to form all at the same time. So this special example is called adaptive radiation. And it's also an example can that leads to like homologous structures. So it comes back, it's like the opposite of convergent evolution. So what happens in adaptive radiation is you have one species that is the common ancestor and what they do is they generally move to a new area. And they may all go to the same area or they may settle into different areas. So it could be that they go move from a mainland into a couple different island areas. Um, so they either settle on one kind of habitat or within several. But the key is in this new area, they move into different niches. So again, it could be that their different niches are on the same area, like same island, or it could be that each kind of, they're separated on different islands and each island makes their own niche. So that's why it could really be allopatric or sympatric, uh, depending on the specifics of it. Uh, usually it's classified as allopatric because of the different niches. So it, it's usually related more to that than anything, but it could be either because there are examples where it certainly happens on one island and then they develop kind of behavioral isolations and so forth. Okay, so different niches. If you have different niches, that leads to different selective pressures. And because they are living in different niches, that's usually the form of isolation. So a good, again, it could actually be they physically can't. Sometimes it's called habitat isolation, which is kind of a subset of geographic, which means they, they're just like 
on different ends of an island. So like technically there's not a barrier, but just they're living in different niches. Therefore they don't tend to leave their niche. Therefore they don't tend to reproduce. Um, so that's kind of a, a bit of a subset depending on where their niches are. Uh, but generally this is acting as kind of the isolating event is that they are in, occupying different places and then the selective pressure at, as a result. And then as a result, they become different species. So that was the front, if you're in my class, of the booklet. Darwin's finches are an example of adaptive radiation. Okay, the other thing I want to, before we go into hybrid, because uh, this is kind of a link into polyploidy and hybridization. So these two isolation forms, another thing to know about both of these is that they also can act as barriers to hybridization. So they can lead to speciation, but they can also play a really important role in preventing the mating of organisms that are genetically incompatible. So these are also important. And we call that barriers to hybridization. So what we don't want to happen is we actually don't want species that are genetically, or they don't want, genetically incompatible species trying to make offspring um, because the offspring that result are not gonna survive or not gonna be fertile and it's a waste of energy. Um, so this kind of prevents that from happening. So it prevents mating attempts by genetically incompatible offspring. So if we have, I think I said the word offspring, but I meant species. So if we have two different species that genetically are not going to be able to make healthy offspring, a lot of times these act as really good barriers. So they don't attempt to mate because they now have different mating times or they don't attempt to mate because they now follow different courtship rituals and that prevents kind of failed mating attempts, which is an overall good thing. Okay, last thing, and I'm gonna, I fit it in tiny, but sorry if you're running at low on space like I was. I did do a pretty tiny version of it, but so that I'm not bending down the whole time, I am gonna delete, uh, erase, and keep going. So I do wanna talk about the third example of this, which is an example of polyploidy. Um, so hybridization or polyploidy. It actually meets these same criteria, so that's why I left these up. So it's a special type of speciation. Um, so just like we had allopatric and sympatric, um, the third type is often called abrupt speciation. And it just happens a lot faster than the others. And it's abrupt speciation by hybridization or polyploidy. So I'm just gonna call it by polyploidy and we'll kind of get to where hybridization might come into that. Okay, let's make really sure that we know what we mean by polyploidy because this comes up in question sometimes. So polyploidy means more than two. So normal is two copies, more than two copies of each chromosome. So in our body, we have 23 different chromosomes. So if we have our two copies, we have 46. So if a human were a polyploidy, they would have three copies times 23, which is 69. So they would have that many chromosomes. Or if they were triploid, they would have 46 plus 46 is 92. Uh, so they would have that many chromosomes. So make sure you're clear that it's not three total. It is three or four of each. So that's really significant. The other thing that we want to look at is this polyploidy actually acts as a reproductive barrier. Because they end up creating, so it acts as a reproductive isolation due to the creation of incompatible gametes. So if you remember back, we said in order for it, the purpose of any sort of reproductive isolation is that it does not allow for gene flow. 
And so if you have incompatible gametes being formed, so if incompatible gametes are formed from the process, then the result is going to be they don't have any genetic crossing between them, lack of gene flow as a result. Okay, very quickly on the two different types um, of this so that we're clear on that. So there are two potential ways in which this can happen. So we can have auto tetraploidy. And that basically means within one species. And so essentially there is a uh, polyploid is form, so a polyploidy event. And usually that polyploidy event occurs as like an error in meiosis. And we haven't done a lot on meiosis where I'm doing this now, um, but essentially what can happen is in the production of gametes within that same species. Um, they basically replicate the DNA and then they fail to separate. So it can happen during meiosis or even early during fertilization. Um, so something happens early on in the organism uh, that results in basically uh, double chromosomes. So polyploidy event, a tetraploid forms, and that tetraploid, which means four copies, and then when that tetraploid undergoes meiosis itself, that tetraploid will make diploid gametes. So that tetraploid then makes diploid gametes. So again, we are doing this before meiosis, which is a little bit tricky. So just a reminder that gametes are supposed to be haploid. So that is the, the norm. So normally speaking, and I'm just putting this over the side. I didn't actually put this on my diagram, but I, if, if it helps you, you might want to put it somewhere. Normally speaking, haploids So gametes are normally haploid. So they have only one of each copy. But instead, we're making diploid gametes, which have two times each instead. So that is not the norm. Okay, if we have the other way this can happen is by allotetraploidy. And I went through a big thing in my class, so assuming you're in my class and you're watching this, um, go back through your diagrams. I'm not going to redraw the whole thing because that's going to take too long. Um, but we went through kind of a clear diagram all this. This is just supposed to be a summary. So allotetraploidy happens from the hybridization between two species. And so two species join together and their offspring is sterile. So then that sterile offspring then undergoes polyploidy. So that can happen essentially again in a zygote. So a way of kind of overcoming being a hybrid that's going to be sterile is to have a polyploidy event happen at conception essentially, or it can happen in meiosis. So they have a sterile offspring, but then when the gametes are formed, the polyploidy event can happen then. Um, so it can happen at different times. Um, but essentially a tetraploid then forms. So it ends up with two, four copies. And in this case, they're two of each different one. So again, this can get a little bit complex. Uh, we might revisit it after we do meiosis. Uh, but for in terms of speciation, you don't really need to be able to account for exactly where the polyploidy event occurs. What I want you to be able to account for is the impact. So again, if the tetraploid forms, and in this case, the tetraploid is actually half of two different species. In this case, it's all one species, but the same impact is that it then makes diploid gametes. So the outcome actually pretty much ends up being the same, which is that in either case, because the organism has four of each chromosome when they divide in meiosis, they end up with two. And then as a result, they can only end up reproducing with each other. So these tetraploids end up reproducing only with each other. So they only 
successfully reproduce with each other. And so if they are no longer reproducing with anything but each other, they are therefore a unique species. So we did talk in class about a lot of times these sometimes are not identified as a unique species because they look so phenotypically similar that without genetic testing, you may not actually see that they are. Uh, whereas allotetraploids too tend to look a little bit different. Uh, so they are more successfully noted um, that they are actually separate species. So just quickly on why that is the case, let's kind of revise again when we look at this reproducing. So if we're under normal circumstances, then you have a haploid gamete plus a haploid gamete, and they actually make a diploid zygote. And sorry, you're probably running out of space because I've gone a little bit beyond what I even said on my sheet. So feel free to not add this if you're feeling more confident with this level of meiosis. And that is good. So diploid zygotes are successful. So diploid zygote, remember zygote is just a baby. So the diploid baby, that is normally the case. However, we said there are times when organisms actually make diploid gametes. So what would happen if we were to take a haploid gamete from a normal plant, and then we were to mix that haploid gamete with a diploid gamete from a tetraploid, what would happen is it would create what is called a triploid gamete, and that triploid gamete would be sterile. So that triploid gamete, odd number of offspring, or sorry, triploid zygote, baby, that triploid zygote would not be successful. So it would either not survive or at, at most survive but be sterile. So that is not a good outcome uh, because again, that doesn't meet the definition of a successful reproduction. So the mixture of these new diploid gametes with the original haploids is not successful. But if you actually take a diploid with a diploid, so a diploid gamete from one tetraploid, and you mix it with a diploid gamete from another tetraploid, and you put them together, that actually creates a tetraploid zygote. And tetraploids are not only able to survive, but they are able to undergo meiosis themselves, and they can make more diploid gametes that can reproduce with each other. So this is another successful situation. So that means, that if they are reproducing with each other, they are able to be successful. So they can make their diploid gametes go together to create offspring, but they cannot actually reproduce with the original non-tetraploids. So these little tetraploids have become their own species. So that is how it is an example of speciation. All right, just to, to be clear, because I think I did that before and I should have made this very clear, this is an HL only concept. So if you are an SL student uh, down the road, you, you do not need to re-revise that, um, but it will be required uh, for HL students. Whole concept, all right, thanks. Okay, hi, so this video is to go through A4, uh, which is the unity and diversity of ecosystems. Um, so we are gonna do it in two parts. So my goal with all these videos is to try to do each subsection on a single page of uh, revision diagrams. So I'll go through more in my board, but it could be done on one page. A little bit more text heavy on this one, uh, so just heads up on that. You may need to write small if you are trying to also keep it to one page. Of course, you do not have to. That's just kind of my goal to try to make myself condense it and not just go into tons and tons of detail again. Uh, so it should be one full page of diagrams on evolution and speciation. So a bit of a strange placement because no matter how you, what order you go through the IB course in, A4 is going to come before D4. Um, so natural selection is actually in D4 in terms of really having to know the details of each step and some uh, really important examples like antibiotic resistance and so forth. Um, so evidence actually predates natural selection, but then here you have to know Darwin versus Lamarck. So a little bit strange. Um, so we're going to do a little bit of revising natural selection because you do have to be able to account for how different things are evidenced for. Um, so let's kind of look at 
the, we're going to do a very brief outline of the steps because that's not really the crux of this. The crux is really then where to, how do the actual evidences back that. Um, so we're going to start, and this is going to kind of be, again, kind of maybe your first half of the page or so. Um, so we're going to look at evolution by natural selection according to Charles Darwin. So evolution by natural selection. And we are introducing here the idea of Charles Darwin having been significant in overriding the work of Lamarck. So we do want to kind of start identifying that that's associated with him. So for the purpose of A4, because uh, again, when we get to D4, we'll be really careful about terminology and steps, but I'm just going to do four general principles for right now. Uh, so it kind of condense a couple things together. And then I want to look at three of those principles and what the evidence is kind of at that step. So hopefully that'll start to help you work out kind of where these various pieces of evidence fall and kind of how they can support it. So again, I want to go through kind of a very brief overview of natural selection itself. Um, so the most important thing that's going to really uh, be crucial for understanding why it's the work of Charles Darwin specifically is that he was the first person to say it has to be heritable material. So we're going to say that it absolutely must begin with genetic variation. didn't himself use the word genetic, so he used heritable, so variation in the heritable material, simply because they didn't know what we now know about DNA uh, and weren't kind of using the term gene in the context that we're using it now. Um, but essentially the same concept. So heritable variation is the same thing as genetic variation. Um, so that's kind of the key component if we're going to talk about natural selection is it has to begin with that. And while we're there, I want to go ahead and make a note that that's really also the fundamental difference between Darwin and Lamarck. So note, this is really what distinguished where Lamarck was the one who basically said that during your lifetime, you acquire traits from use and then pass those on. This was the distinction that said, no, we're only looking at traits that you're born with that are in your DNA that are heritable. Um, so this is the key distinction from Lamarck's work. And so what we, Lamarck said that we now know is not true uh, was the idea, Lamarck's view, on passing on acquired traits. So I'm just to make it clear, I'll say lifetime acquired traits. <laughs> So we now know that you definitely cannot pass on anything you acquire during your lifetime. That's just simply not how uh, heredity works. And so this idea of kind of lifetime acquired traits being able to be passed on has been falsified. That's just a little IV word for us to make sure we're using which just means there has been evidence that has shown it is not true. Okay, so that's kind of our first step is that we have to begin with genetic variation. Then the next thing that's really important is the role of the environment. So basically what he said is that in the environment there are threats or competition for survival. So survival is not a guarantee. Um, and that survival pressure creates differential selective pressure, which means depending on the environment, the pressure to survive is going to be different. So different environments propose different kind of selective advantages. Um, so we're going to say threats to or competition for survival. in each environment, so it's not the same in every environment. And that's gonna kinda of come up as we start looking at this evidence. 
And so the particular kind of threats that are in that environment is what we call differential selective pressure, which means the selective, the pressures to be selected to survive are different in your different environment. Um, so it leads to, and this is a key word, um, so I'll, just, I'll box it in a second, but differential selective pressures. And so basically break down the word, pressure is like a threat or competition, so something that you're having to work for. Um, selective means some things are better than others, and differential means different things depending on the environment. So differential selective pressures, and one thing you can kind of summarize that by saying basically the adaptations differ in each environment. So what is better depends on the environment uh, is basically what that's saying. So different environments, different adaptations. Uh, I'm just going to write that under in case that's a little bit So that's another way you can think of that term, because we're going to use it again when we get to speciation. So I just want to make sure we're clear on what that means. Okay, then the next piece, which is, we're not actually going to, it's a huge piece of Lamarck, uh, I mean, sorry, of Darwin, but we're not going to talk a ton about it today in terms of evidence. We'll go to the last part. Um, but basically what he said is essentially the different pressures mean uh, that those with the adaptation survive longer. So longer survival Whoa, I didn't need to do it in that color. And the particular, the longer the survival is if you have the adaptation. And if you survive longer, you go on to have more offspring. So if you know kind of what Darwin's known for that hits on that survival of the fittest, which is essentially kind of the crux of his argument as to how all of this is driven. And then the last point comes back to the first one, which essentially says if we know that the adaptation is genetic to begin with. So whatever this adaptation is, it is genetic, so therefore it gets passed on. So inheritance of the adaptation by the many offspring leads to an increase in adaptation over time. So inheritance of the adaptation by the many offspring, so I am clarifying that, so it's important that they had more offspring, and what that leads to is an increase in the adaptation over time. And anytime we talk about change over time, that is evolution. So I probably should have defined evolution to begin with, but change in heritable material over time. So anytime we have a change in the heritable or genetic material over time, that is the definition of evolution. Okay, so again, all of those points we're going to kind of come now to and say, okay, well, what evidence backs up these different parts? So we could say, uh, for instance, the course is basically removed fossil record as evidence you need to know, in part because the fossil record doesn't actually tell us much about natural selection. So all the fossil record does is say there have been changes over time, period. Uh, it cannot pinpoint whether it's related to the genetic material. It cannot pinpoint whether it's related to number of offspring. So we're actually not going to go into those kind of really open-ended uh, evidences. We're going to look at slightly more specific ones. So there's actually three different evidences you need to know. Um, biochemical evidence, anatomy, so homologous analogous structures, and then the looking at selective breeding as a model for natural selection, so therefore evidence for it. So those are kind of our different components. So let's start here. So if we're trying to say, according to Darwin, that it's the heritable material that's changed and that's what's driven this whole process, one bit of evidence that's available to us now is to actually study that heritable material and check, 
Does it line up? Does it look like changes in DNA correlate to kind of differences between species? So we'll kind of start with evidence one. And it's really starting at this beginning of the pathway. So we'll say evidence. And the particular evidence we are talking about is sequence data. You can see it phrased different ways. You can sometimes see it called molecular data, um, so biochemical data. So a couple of different ways you might see that phrased. Um, but you need to know not a lot on this. There's more on this. This is going to kind of come up again in looking at um, phylogenies and cladograms and things like that are actually in A3. Uh, so this is just connecting the idea of degree of similarity. So we can analyze three things. So the analysis of DNA, mRNA or some sort of RNA, and amino acid sequences, which remember all show us the same thing in different steps. So if we analyze the DNA, we're like analyzing the original recipe. If we analyze the amino acid sequences, I'm like tasting the cookies to look at how different they are in their outcome. So same kind of concept, just depends on how detailed you wanna go. Um, so when you analyze them, what you see uh, is basically closely related species have fewer differences in their DNA. So if two organisms seem really similar, so when we say like closely related, that can be in terms of kind of known evolution or even just in terms of kind of physical similarity or morphological, sometimes the word you'll see. Um, so organisms that look more similar to one another tend to have more genetic material in common as well. Organisms that look more different have more differences in their genetic material. So what that's suggesting is there does seem to be a correlation between genetic similarity and kind of adaptations. So organisms that share common adaptations have more genetics in common. Organisms that have different adaptations have more genetic differences. So it's just pointing out that there does seem to be a correlation between genetic material and kind of overall differences in the species. You can use this. Uh, so this information can be used to kind of track relationships. So it can be used to illustrate evolutionary relationships. And we do those on phylogenetic trees or cladograms, which is an important thing to bear in mind. And we can call them, they have slight differences between them. That'll come up kind of in um, A3, but you can basically use them interchangeably. Um, but those, you will not have to do that on an A4 test. So if you're studying this for the A4 test, don't worry about that, but if you're studying it to revise for exams, by that point, you hopefully have put all of it together and you could have to use this information here and use what you know from A3 about how to build a cladogram and merge them together to do so. Okay, the next bit of, uh, next bit of evidence is really gonna come here, which is looking at this idea of selective pressures driving differences between organisms. Um, so we're gonna, I'm gonna put it in this middle area even though it's primarily focused on there. And the evidence here is basically to look at homologous and analogous structures. So I, in AP, we would call that comparative anatomy. It's generally, I don't think they actually use that um, wording in IB. So you can just kind of think of it as looking at the two types of structures. So essentially anatomy being your body parts, so actually looking at organisms' body parts and seeing how similar and different are they. Um, so there's two types that you'll need to know for this. So you'll need to know the difference between homologous structures and analogous structures. And they both are evidence for the same thing. So they're both ways of seeing that the environment and the pressures of your environment drive evolution. So they both show this, that concept of how important differential selection is, um, but just in slightly different ways. So remember, homo means same, 
So when we talk homologous structures, we're talking similar internal structure, but different functional use. So these are structures that internally look similar, and that's thought to be because of genetic similarity, um, but now have evolved different uses based on different selective pressures. Um, so different selective pressures have caused what was once a shared bone structure to be used for different purposes. The examples that you do need to know for this are the pendactyl limbs, And so what the pendactyl limbs are showing is again, same structure. So the horse leg, the whale fin, and the bat wing all have the same basic bone alignment. So same bones, but they're obviously evolved to use them differently. So they have the same basic internal structure, but over time, because of differential selective pressures, because uh, of different environments, they've now adapted them to use that same underlying thing for a different purpose. So again, different selective pressures, different environments, now they've changed. Um, this is evidence of a common ancestor. So when we see homologous structures, we would say, okay, common ancestry is indicated there, um, and they've evolved differences due to different environments. So common ancestor, different environments. And that's really where the differences have arose and why they're now different. So selective pressures cause those differences. Analogous structures then are gonna be the opposite of that. So we say analogous structures, these are gonna be different structurally, but used for the same purpose. And so if we keep going with our wing example, because we mentioned that here, example for this would be like a butterfly, a bat, and a bird wing. And so in each case, it's used for flight. But if you look at their internal makeup, a butterfly wing has no bones, birds have an outline of bone and then feathers, and then the bat wing has boning all throughout. So quite unique, different structures. Uh, so made up totally different, but being used for the same purpose. And so the argument is this supports the idea of convergent evolution. And when we say convergent evolution, this time they've kind of separately evolved the same adaptations. So no common ancestor. But the reason why they've each evolved it is to do to the similar selective pressures. So it's again showing that idea that same selective pressures can make you more common to organisms that you don't have an ancestry with, while different selective pressures can cause you to become more different from ones that you do. So they're both two sides of the same coin that both show the same thing, which is your environment determines whether you become more alike or more different, depending on whether you have the same environment or different environments. So you are going to be molded according to your environment, and both of these are showing evidence of that. Okay, and then the last one for this unit is the last bit of evidence, and I'm just putting it here in terms of where it fits in, um, and that is the idea of selective breeding. So evidence is selective breeding. And the reason why it's evidence is because what it shows is the idea that if you produce more offspring from one adaptation or variation, that adaptation will increase over time. So it supports the idea that the number of offspring lead to a change over time. So it's pointing this idea of as long as you are tracking and it's a genetic trait, offspring production is linked to evolution. So when we're talking about this, what basically happens is instead of adaptations, it's human choice. So essentially humans choose to breed 
plants and animals with what they consider to be a beneficial trait. So with um, desire trait, and that desire trait could be like thicker kernels on corn. So that's an example we looked at. So the kind of the more juicy the corn is, the better the food source could be, yes, yeah, sweeter fruits, things like that. Um, and not breed those with undesirable. So essentially it's causing an increase in the breeding. So therefore those with desired traits have more offspring. So organisms with the desired trait are deliberately bred more and therefore have more offspring. Um, and then because of that, uh, having more offspring, you see the increase in the amount of that desired trait over time. Um, so then have more offspring, and then that leads to an increase in the desired traits and a decrease in the undesired traits. And in particular, it, you will see actually relatively, um, when farmers do this quite aggressively, it can lead to quite substantial and fast changes in species. So we can actually see species change quite quickly due to this. One example, it could be worth noting an example. So an example that we all know, but just to remind, is that basically all dog breeds are the result of breeding from wolves initially. And again, if you look at what is desirable and undesirable, really good examples whereby an undesirable trait uh, in domesticated dogs is being aggressive. So we've actually bred away from aggressive dogs, even though in potentially in the wild, that actually would have been a really beneficial trait. So we've kind of, it's what we decide is desirable or not, and that has a big impact. So essentially, how is this evidence? So basically it says that this process is called artificial selection. And artificial selection is really similar to natural selection and therefore evidence for. So the fact that we can actually see, it doesn't relate to survival, but it does relate to this concept here, that if you find genetic variations and cause those with the variation to have more offspring, you can see it increase over time. It hits that kind of basic concept of how reproductive success is linked to evolution. Um, and so that's why it's considered evidence for natural selection, because it's looking at the same concept. Okay, one last thing I want to put on this, and then I'm going to erase, and that's half the page, and then we need to do speciation. Um, one thing I want to note is that when we are talking, anytime we are talking natural selection, we are talking, we are tracking a change in one species. So when we look at natural selection, it is the cause of changes within species. So that's significant because what we're gonna talk about now is speciation. Um, so speciation is gonna be the formation of a new species. So there is related, because we will talk a little bit about differential selective pressure again, um, but natural selection by definition is not creating new species. It's actually just changes within a species. Um, if we in fact are, this leads to in some way a new species forming, we actually call that speciation, which is our next part. Okay, so that's all things that. Part two is speciation. I'm just gonna raise my board and keep going from that.